Hi, everybody. Welcome to the RTSO lunchtime webinar. Today we have Margaret McKinnon back again with us for her part two of her um, mental wellness talk. Today's uh, focus will be on caring for yourself in COVID-19 pandemic, tips and tricks and strategies for your own mental health. Um, we are hoping today to have um, uh, a little bit more time for your questions and answers at the end. And that's the slide. Do you Okay, and then our speaker today again is Dr. Margaret McKinnon. Um, she's a Homewood Chair in Mental Health and Trauma, Associate Professor at McMaster University, and a scientist at the Homewood Research Institute. She's a psychologist in the Mood Disorders Program here at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. And her work at, as Homewood Chair in Mental Health and Trauma focuses to advance the clinical practice and outcomes and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and related illness on a national level. Um, Margaret has very kindly agreed to collaborate with the RTSO in our work um, in PTSD as it relates to respiratory therapists. And um, we're still striving to do that study we want to do yeah. and get our T's in that uh, bill um yes uh, legislations we haven't forgotten we just need our little COVID-19 to go away and let us get back <laughs> we, do. we do <laughs> so we do. <laughs> I will turn it over to Margaret now thanks uh, Margaret do you see I do yes yeah, so I'll show my screen um then I'll go up here and I just want to start by thanking the RTSO both for their collaboration and having me here today. It's such an honor um, to be part of your community, especially during a difficult time. And I really am grateful for the invitation to come back and talk a bit today about tips and strategies for mental wellness for all of us during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I also want to express my deep commitment to doing the study with this group around PTSD in respiratory therapists as well as what we can do to help with that. And we are certainly in conversations now around starting that study, and I should have an update in the next couple of weeks around that. So I look forward to coming back and talking about that as well, if that's okay with the RTSO. <laughs> so let me just get started. Um, some of what I'm gonna talk about today will be a bit of a rehash of last time because I wasn't sure who would be new and who had been here previously. That said, I'll go through those materials more quickly um, so that we have time to get to some of the tips and strategies and also time for discussion. So I'll just start by saying that the views that I have today um, are don't necessarily um, are necessarily the views of McMaster, our St. Joseph's, our Homewood Research Institute. So I'm speaking freely um, is myself, and I will express some opinions, and those are my own opinions. Um, so just to go back as we start thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's really important again for us to remember that this situation is truly unprecedented. Um, we're finding ourselves in a time where despite the best um, training that we were, have been so lucky to have, the best equipment, the best colleagues, we're still in a situation now where we have limited control and we also have uncertain outcomes. And often our best approaches and what we've done in the past doesn't necessarily work during the current pandemic. And I think that's been a struggle for all of us if we, as we face this situation. Um, again, we also know that no one can fully prepare for a pandemic. So I don't think any of us were prepared for that second week of March when we were told that we had a pandemic and that our lives were about to change completely. Both our work lives, our home lives, our lives with our family and our, and our social lives. And I think that's important to remember that it really isn't always possible to prepare, but that we can learn lessons from what's happening right now to make us stronger as individuals and also stronger as a profession. So lessons that can be learned from this pandemic that will assist all of us and the RTSO in its work going forward. Um, I was reminded of this again today, that dealing with COVID-19, it's not a sprint. I think sometimes we feel that we have to put all our efforts in at once, that we have to go as fast as we can to get things done, to help as many people as possible, 
um, and to just go at a, a rapid pace. And I think what we have to remember, and it's, it's worth repeating, is that this is not a sprint, it's not a race. We're in a long marathon here. And, and the, the beauty of that marathon is that we're in it together, that we're here to support one another through this society. Um, when we work together side by side, and when we're outside of the workplace, the support that we offer one another. And that will be a long marathon for us, but it's also one that will help us to grow closer together. I think certainly we're all in this together, as we know, and we're all learning together. So all of us are in a process of learning against what really is an enemy in essence that we don't know much about and we're learning together about it. And that's important, that sense of community, that we're brothers and sisters as healthcare workers in this fight, um, regardless of what our profession is. So respiratory therapists, psychologists, physicians, nurses, psychiatrists, we're in this together and we're here to support one another. Um, we also know that in the current pandemic, it feels like there are no right or wrong answers. Often the decisions that we have to make are very, very gray, um, and it's hard to know what the right decision is. And I think it's one of those situations where, you know, one, one problem that often leads to some distress or mental health difficulty is black and white thinking. So thinking that there's either a right or a wrong. And what I've really found during this pandemic, and I would imagine other people listening have as well, is that often we're dealing with situations of gray where we will have to make a decision and that sometimes that decision is simply between wrong and wronger and we have to do the best that we can. And I think that's really my last point here on this slide is that all of us are trying our best. We're doing our best um, with the skills that we have and the experiences that we have. And sometimes our best doesn't always feel good enough, but I think we're all committed to that. I think in saying that as well, I think there's often, I've, I've heard this a lot from people and I just wanted to reflect on this today is that, I think we often hear from the public that there's an expectation that as healthcare workers or as people who wear uniforms, um, that we don't have mental health vulnerabilities, that we don't have physical health vulnerabilities, that we'll march in just as strong individuals who don't have those underlying concerns, mental health concerns or physical health concerns. But we are very, very human as healthcare workers. We come to this situation with our histories. Many of us may have um, had difficulties or suffered with depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, um, as well as we may have health vulnerabilities. So many of us may have underlying illnesses that make us more vulnerable, or we may have family members with illnesses that may also render them more vulnerable to this illness. So we don't come here as superheroes or superhumans. We come to this pandemic as human beings who have vulnerabilities. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that ourselves um, with other healthcare workers and also for the public to recognize this. I think that's tremendously important and something we really need to do education about and educate others about. I've said this before, but we, as healthcare workers, we're dedicated to serving Canadians. We made a choice to go into a profession that is helping and one that is a, a life of service. And that's a choice that we've made. And while that comes at a cost, that's a very noble profession and one that we're all committed to. We view ourselves as very prepared. So we, we have the best training, the best experience, um, the best and the best community to come at this. But despite that, these best efforts may not be enough in the face of COVID-19. We see ourselves as very competent on average, and we're also, we see ourselves as professional. And that preparedness, that competency, and that professionalism arms us well for the pandemic, but it can again give rise to that sense that we're superhuman, that, we're, that we're, the public wants us to be a superhero in this situation, and yet we are still human and have vulnerabilities like everyone else. One thing though that we do know is, um, as healthcare workers is that we often have to deal with very wicked problems and we have to make tough decisions in the work that we do. And oftentimes we have to make those very tough decisions on the spot. And I think those same sort of decisions are occurring right now in the midst of the pandemic and really in a very challenging way, in a situation where information is constantly changing. 
So as I told you last time I was here, um, I do have, in addition to my clinical work and um, my research work, I also have an administrative role. And when I send out emails, I find within minutes those um, the decisions that have been made or the information that we're sharing has changed. And again, that makes the current situation very, very challenging for all of us. And we know that the that COVID-19 has changed the healthcare, healthcare context. And I think, to be honest, I think it's changed us permanently and irrevocably. Um, I had talked last week about what are some, or a couple of weeks ago, about what are some of the risk factors for us around the current pandemic. And I talked about this within the context of moral injury. And a lot of the mental health um, tips and strategies that I'm going to talk about today are going to relate back to that moral injury that we talked about last time. But I'm going to come to that point just to reiterate that concept for anyone who may not have been there. But I want to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and how that really is putting us at risk, not only for moral injury, but also for mental health um, difficulties in general. So we know right now that as healthcare workers, we're watching the loss of life at times of very vulnerable people. And Fatima, Kelly and I were just talking, for example, about some of the, the difficulties that have occurred within our long-term care homes in the provinces. And we're seeing people that as healthcare workers, we believe it is our duty to protect and to care for. And those incredibly vulnerable people are actually among those who are facing the worst burden and the worst outcomes from COVID-19. At times in this pandemic, I think there's been times when leaders have been perceived not to take responsibility for the event. Um, I think part of that is indeed around that pandemic pay issue, where I think all healthcare professionals should have access to full pandemic pay, just like nurses and physicians. And there may also be cases, again, where leaders may be making decisions, but may be perceived or may not be taking responsibility after they make those decisions. And that has an impact on all of us. You know, leaders like everyone else, I would say this, I think on average, all leaders are trying to do the best that they can, but at times they can also be perceived as unsupportive. And that doesn't come necessarily from a lack of care, but I think from a lack of what do we do in this situation? All of us are in a situation where we're not fully prepared for how to handle this. Um, I think as we went into this pandemic, many of us were unaware of what some of the potential emotional or psychological consequences may be. I think respiratory therapists probably less so because you've already been through, many of you, through SARS and MERS and understood. I, I know I started talking to you very early in this and people talked about the difficult burden of SARS and MERS and the scar that that has left on your community. But at times we felt unprepared for emotionally for what we were going to need to face during this and also for the psychological consequences of some of the decisions that we've had to make. So for example, whether a patient is um, receives a ventilator or whether a patient is put on their stomach instead to see if that increases breathing. And that's again, from what I've, everything I've heard, I'm not a physician, but for what I've heard from your community and from others is that's often a very difficult decision. Um, and sometimes we really don't know what the outcome will be. And sometimes there is that hindsight bias where we might have, be tempted to look back um, and judge the decisions that we made when we now have all the information, which we didn't have then. And that can give rise to um, feelings of self-judgment our guilt or shame when in fact now we have that benefit of hindsight where we can look back and we have more information or knowledge. And I think we need to be very careful to protect our mental health and not to judge ourselves or not to judge one another. Um, we also know that what's happening right now is happening during a very unstable time in the world. Um, we are seeing certainly what's happening in the United States right now and the long history of racism both in Canada and the United States. And I think at the time that we're experiencing a pandemic here in Canada and across the world, there's also um, a great deal, I think, of appropriate recognition of what's been happening in the world and attempts to change that. Um, and so we're in a very unique historical context right now which can make things all the more difficult. Um, many of people as well are also experiencing job loss within their homes. Um, there have been economic losses for our partners, our spouses, um, for our children who we may also worry about. 
There's tremendous burden. It's also very difficult for people who have ch children at home to care for those children while also going to work and fulfilling our duties as healthcare professionals. For many people, because we're now in a pandemic situation and not allowed to have gatherings of more than five people, some of us have lost that social support that we rely upon so heavily. And I can tell you right now that social support is the single greatest predictor of whether or not someone goes on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder after being exposed to a traumatic event. And so as much as we can, and as much as we are able, we really do need to come together in meetings like this, for example, through the Society of Respiratory Therapists, to come together and to support one another. The more we do that at work, one-on-one -on -one is peers, um, and through gatherings like this, the more we protect ourselves against the potential for mental injury or for PTSD during this situation. Um, we certainly know that, and I, I think I'm going to come back to this when I talk more about tips and strategies, that our history really influences how we interpret current events. And in trauma, we talk about the 90-10 rule. So 10% of what's happening right now is based on what's, what's happening. How we interpret what's happening right now is based on what's happening in the moment. The remaining 90% is based upon our past experiences. So a good example of that would be if a decision is made um, in the hospital or in the community and it's a decision that we don't agree with, part of the way we interpret that decision will be based on what's happening. So our current assessment of risk, our current knowledge, but the other 90% tends to be driven by past events and past experiences. And we know, for example, that individuals who have a history of childhood abuse, um, who have not had control in the past over their bodies, over the decisions that are being made for them, part of that past history can really influence how we interpret current events. So if, if someone who is a child, and that's many of us, didn't have the opportunity to make decisions for ourselves, didn't have control over our own bodies, when decisions are made within the context of COVID-19, it can become very tricky where those past experiences become mixed in with our current experiences. I've also heard from respiratory therapists who say the current situation brings up memories of what occurred during SARS and MERS and can make this current situation even more difficult. And as a tip or a strategy, what can be really important when you're finding yourself very anxious or distressed is to take a moment and reflect upon that, to think, you know, how much of how I'm feeling right now is driven by what's happening in this moment and what things in my past might be driving how I'm experiencing this moment as well. So if, for example, um, I know myself, I have a history of being in, a, in an airline um, accident. Um, I know that often when I'm feeling very anxious, I knew that I, I for, for example, was very, very anxious to go back to our hospital during this pandemic. I had a very, very elevated level of anxiety. And I had to look at that and say, how much of this is what's happening right now? And how much of this is the past? So how much of this is my anxiety that's coming from my past experience of having been on an airplane that ran out of fuel and made a essentially crash landing? Um, how much is being driven by, by that past experience and how much is being driven by the present level of risk? And I think when we take the time to sit down and unpack some of our reactions and look at both the current experience and the past experience, that can really help us to get through what's happening right now. And I would really encourage people to do that um, as they face some of the current situation. We talked about a lot last time about moral injury and really what moral injury is, is a sense of um, either guilt or shame around an experience that you're having um, where you feel that you've had to violate your own morals or ethics or values. And in COVID-19, what we're hearing from the healthcare community is that it's not so much that people feel um, they've made the wrong decision, it's that they don't have the information they need to make a decision. And so not having the information needed are the, you know, the information, past studies, past statistics, 
the weight of experience from other situations like COVID-19, it can be incredibly frustrating for all of us to have to make decisions during the pandemic when we don't have a lot of information to make those. And when I talk about PTSD, I always tell people that PTSD is not just fear. It's often thought about in the newspapers and in the media as fear. So that, for example, when military members come back from Afghanistan or Rwanda, that they have fear of being attacked or fear um, of others around them. And that's a part of, of the experience of PTSD for some people. But for many people, PTSD is associated with guilt and shame. So a sense of guilt around what's happened, for example, that patients' lives may have been lost, or shame that maybe I should have done something differently, maybe it's something about me. Um, and that is often can give rise to senses of, you know, having a lack of self-compassion, blaming oneself, punishing oneself, um, not giving yourself what you need in this moment. So we often talk about with guilt and shame around traumatic incidences that people don't seek out the care that they need or give themselves the time to care for themselves. And that can come from a deep sense of shame. And so I think when we talk about PTSD, it's really important for us to remember that self-compassion and self-care is tremendously important. And not judging ourselves, but rather thinking about, for example, if my daughter was a respiratory therapist working in the hospital right now, and she told me that she was concerned that she had made the wrong decision today, how would I speak to her? Or if this was another coworker, another respiratory therapist, and they had had a difficult day, and they were telling me about something that they were worried about, what would I say to them? And what would I urge them to do? And as psychologists, what we ask people to do is turn that around and talk to yourself, right? So if you were to say to your daughter, you know, honey, I know that was really difficult. And I, you know, I understand how hard it was for you and there's no judgment here. I just want you to take care of yourself. We want you to be able to turn that around to yourself and have that same self-talk for you to say, you know what, I understand what you, your, what you myself is going through and I want you to take care of yourself. I want you to slow down. I want you to have compassion. If we can just use that simple technique or tip to turn around what you would say to someone else and say that to yourself, that can often be very, very powerful. As we talked about um, last time I was here, moral injury can also involve a sense of betrayal. So a sense of anger or betrayal that people or organizations who were supposed to protect us during the current pandemic, for example, we might feel that we haven't been protected adequately, that we haven't received the support that we deserve. And I'm gonna talk again about how that sense of betrayal can drive some of the emotions and feelings that we're having, and some of the tips and techniques and strategies that we can use around that. I just want to remind people of what I think is a really important um, quote that illustrates the concept of moral injury and also what some of us could be feeling um, during the current situation. And this is a quote from a Vietnam veteran, but I think again, um, we really have to remember that a lot of what we face in healthcare is much like what first responders and even military members face. And I think this is particularly the case during COVID-19 when we're almost in the fog of war right now, where there's a lot happening um, at a very fast and rapid pace. We don't have all the information we need. We don't necessarily have the equipment that we need, and we really don't know what the outcome will be. So it's in many ways, um, we've written about this, that so this is much like a war um, that we're fighting right now together. And we know that military members, soldiers come together during war, and that's the same thing that we're doing together right now. But this Vietnam vet veteran said, if somebody found out about me, they might run. Um, previously, I'd been in a PTSD group, and there was one of the guys in the group who said that when he looked into the eyes of a person that hadn't been in Vietnam, it was kind of like looking into the eyes of a baby. They were just innocent. I had that same experience, and part of me really wishes I could get that innocence back, that's something I wish very often. And when I think about the mental health consequences of, PT, of, rather of COVID-19 and the other situations that we face as healthcare workers, 
often there is that feeling that when we when we come home and we walk through the door and suddenly we're expected to be a mother or a father or a wife or a husband in that moment instantaneously, sometimes when we look at other people, it, it might almost feel like they're babies, that they haven't had that same experience. Um, they're, they're very innocent. And that if we talk about our experiences to them, I think we often worry that we might harm others by telling them about our experiences. And really part of that I think comes back to who can we talk to, who can we disclose our experiences to, and what sort of support are we able to expect? And I think it's really important, it sounds very simple, but it's so true that we need to be able to come together either one-on-one -on -one with, with other peers, other people who have shared the experiences, to come together as a group to talk about these experiences because we're not innocent to what's happening here right now and we know that we have a shared experience. And when we're together with others who can talk about that, debrief about it and share that experience together, that is very powerful. Um, I was asked last time I was here, is it best that we do that, you know, as a whole group? So physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, and so on. I really have took that question seriously. Um, I've talked to a number of people about that um, in the PTSD community. And we all agree that the starting place is to come together is respiratory therapists together. Because your experience that you're having as a group in a community is unique. And sharing that with one another, either one-on-one -on -one or as a group, I think is going to go a very long way in this. And I just want to encourage people not to hold that inside of yourself, not to hold your experience inside of yourself. If you're going home and feeling afraid that you can't talk to your family members about it, it's really important that we have the opportunity as healthcare workers to talk to one another, either one-on-one -on -one or as a group about our experiences. And that really is one of the most powerful antidotes around the development of psychological injuries or difficulties in a situation like this. Oops, oops. Um, and we certainly know that during the current pandemic that many individuals, as I talked about last week, may be experiencing that sense that they're being asked to make very difficult decisions in the healthcare um, setting, that they may have to decide between right or wrong, and they may, may also feel as if they've been betrayed by their organizations or people meant to protect them. So I'm just having a bit of trouble switching the slides. I'm just going to... See, um, so what I would say here is that, as I said before, often it's that cumulative burden of the things that are happening. It's just not a single thing that has happened while we're in this pandemic, but it's the multiple things that keep happening. And sometimes is this was a quote from a, a first responder who said, it's not um, one big, big thing all the time. It's those little rocks that keep getting stuck in your shoes. And the more and more rocks there are, the more it irritates us. And sometimes it's the big thing that will break the camel's back, but sometimes it's the small. And when I think again about tips and strategies around mental health and mental resilience, I think about that we need to be mindful both in ourselves and in others, that it's not just the big things that are gonna cause difficulty for us. When a series of small things happen, that can be equally distressing and they can build up. And as they build up, that can give rise to great difficulties and even to times when we find ourselves exploding, when we feel lost, when we feel hopeless. And again, we need to be very mindful as a community that again, it's not just those big events that occur. Sometimes it's the very small ones as well that get us in trouble. We've talked a lot about what some of the unique experiences of healthcare workers may be during this pandemic situation. And, you know, we have, a, I think as healthcare workers, we have a lot of different feelings. Um, I know for myself, um, I was away from the hospital for about three weeks in the beginning. Um, I had been sent home as part of whatever we were supposed to do. Um, and during that time, I could, I could certainly say that I felt very guilty during that time, that I wanted to be there helping others um, and being part of our response. And, you know, when we do become ill with COVID-19 or we're asked to go into isolation, we can have a real sense of, a sense of guilt or shame um, around being at home and not being there to help. And I think we really, again, this comes back to self-compassion and giving ourselves a break. Um, if we were talking to any one of our colleagues who said, you know, I've been potentially exposed, 
I have to go home. We would say to them, well, that's the right thing to do. You're protecting other people by doing that. So how can we turn that talk back onto ourselves and say, you know, it's really important that we do this to protect others, but we also, I want you to take care of yourself. I want to take care of myself to make sure I'm okay during this situation so that I can go back and help. Um, I think as well, I've heard this a number of times, that sometimes there's a stigma around healthcare workers who do um, end up contracting COVID-19 because there can be judgments around, did that person use their PPE, um, PPE um, in the right way? You know, were there a slip up? But I think, again, we're all human. Um, the, this can occur, it, we can catch this in so many different ways that we have no idea how it happened. And in fact, in a high paced, rapid environment, like the ones that we face every day when we go to work, accidents happen all the time, right? And so I think, again, not blaming and not judging ourselves and also having that compassion for others is so important at this difficult time. I think many of us also have great concerns about putting our families at risk and worries about bringing something deadly home to our families. And again, I think this is a situation of self-compassion, of thinking about that the support that our family has given us, while also taking, of course, the necessary precautions. So when we when we look at what healthcare workers are asking for from their hospitals and from their communities, we really want our organizations to see us, to protect us, to prepare us, to support us and to care for us. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and what that might mean for us as individuals and also for us as organizations. It's also very important that we are included in decision making, making as healthcare workers and that we're told what is happening. Um, so I think it's really important that we're able to recognize um, the uncertainty that all of us are expressing um, and to hear that to again, to provide the adequate personal protective equipment, um, to have rapid access to testing, because sometimes those simple things that we can do can actually really turn the volume down on the mental distress that people are experiencing. Um, we need all the support and training that can possibly be provided to help us to give high quality care to our patients. And we really, I think, do both as leaders and as frontline workers, we all need to acknowledge the human limitations that occur during high risk, high, um, high load, high stress, high uncertainty situations, and recognize that, again, that we're not all going to be superhuman in this situation. We all come, again, as I said earlier, with unique vulnerabilities. So I know myself, I have a history of PTSD and of depression. And I recognize that vulnerability and the impact that it's had on me during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know that probably the majority of people sitting in this audience today also probably come with those same vulnerabilities. Um, and we need to be able to recognize that in ourselves, but also in others. And again, have compassion for ourselves and have compassion for others in the same situation. Um, and we also need to have available supports to us. And I'm gonna talk about both those institutional supports, but also those that we can provide to ourselves. Last time I came here, I had the, the opportunity to introduce very briefly the mental health continuum model. And what that really is, is a model that was developed by the Canadian military to give us a sense of when we may be experiencing psychological difficulties when we may be reacting to a current situation, when we're at a point that we're injured and should really start looking for help, and then when we're critically ill, we need to get assistance in that moment as quickly as possible. So I'm gonna start at the healthy end of the continuum and just talk about recognizing what's normal um, and what can be you know, something that we're having a reaction, but again, that reaction is normal. So the example that we often give um, is, you know, as we get older, we may have more difficulty recalling names. I certainly have had that difficulty as I've gotten older. Um, and that's a normal part of aging. But when we have difficulty recalling everyone's names or it's very frequent and interfering with our lives, that's when we start to worry about risk. And we can apply those same principles to mental health. So 
we know that in a situation like this, it is normal for us to have a reaction to what we're seeing and what we're hearing. It actually makes us human. So when we feel distressed about what we're seeing, um, when we you know, question our own judgment and the judgment of others, that is a normal human reaction. And it does not mean that we will go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder or acute stress. It means that we're having a normal reaction that most human beings would have in this situation. And in some cases, that reaction will subside or will be toned down or tuned down. And in other cases, it will get worse. But if we think about what does healthy represent, we know that for the majority of people, we are going to experience distress during this situation. Um, and again, that that's normal. When we look at how we can judge how we're coping with some of this, we need to recognize that when we're healthy, it's normal that our mood will fluctuate. Um, that's very normal, particularly under difficult situations like this. But if on average and most of the time we feel that we're calm and we're taking things in stride, that's a good indicator that most of the time we're able to do that. That's a good indicator of health. When we're able to maintain our sense of humor, where we feel that we're performing as well as we can under the current situations, and when we, in, we feel in control, have a sense of control, again, that's often a sign of good health. When our sleep is remaining relatively normal and we have few um, difficulties with our sleep, we're remaining physically and socially active, and we're when we're limiting our use of alcohol or gambling, these are signs that while we may be having normal human reactions of distress to a very difficult situation, for the most part, we're probably in this, what the military would call the green zone. We're relatively healthy. And you can see at the top of this screen that we're really going from running the spectrum of mental health reactions from green on up to red, where we're really, really needing assistance. For most of us, though, we can get into reacting mode. This will happen for many people during this situation. And that's where we're starting to see a bit of a warning sign emerge. This is like the yellow light is coming on the traffic light. We just stop and pause and think about how we can best help ourselves when this is happening. And really think back on things that have helped you in the past when you're in this situation. For example, people who are normally quite good natured, um, have a lot of patience. In a difficult situation like this, they may find themselves becoming a bit more irritable and a bit, bit more impatient. I think if we take the time, excuse me, the time to really reflect upon how we're feeling, and if we recognize these warning symptoms, this yellow light creeping on, really just give us a sense that we need to pause and maybe engage in some self-care. When I think about self-care, I think about strategies that have worked for us in the past. Um, for example, if you've had a really difficult day and you've found in the past that going for a walk, having a cup of tea, having a hot bath, that may be something that's worked for you in the past that we, because of how rapid and so many things are happening right now, you may not be taking the time to do that right now. But in fact, it's like being on an airline um, when the oxygen mask comes down. And I can tell you because I've actually had this happen. You really do need to put that oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on others to care for them. So when you're starting to have these warning signs of being irritable, impatient, a creeping sense of nervousness, feeling of sadness or being overwhelmed. Um, when you start to feel more forgetful because you're just overwhelmed by the situation, and you're starting to have difficulty with some sleeping difficulties, your know, thoughts of the day and the day's difficulties may be intruding upon your home life, are reminders of past events. Um, and when you're also attuned to your body because trauma in trauma, and in stress, the body keeps the score. It's not just what's happening in our head, it's also what's happening in our body. And so as the burden of stress accumulates, we may begin to feel tension in our muscles. We may begin to have more headaches, to have fatigue and low energy. And again, what I would say here is you need to put the oxygen mask on yourself. You need to take the time to do those things that in the past have helped you. 
again, for some people that might be activities like mindfulness, meditation, getting back to your regular exercise. Some people talk about going for a run where they just lose their sense of self and time. Whatever it is in the past that has allowed you to feel better, you really do need to take the time for that. Um, we also find that too, when people start to become stressed or distressed, they may st um, start to withdraw a bit from you know, engaging with their friends, engaging with their family, having decreased activity. And I know we can't be physically together, that, but that doesn't mean that we can't be together through other ways. For example, like we're coming together today. So we really advise to experiment. If you're finding yourself withdrawing and you think, oh, it's just too much effort tonight to call my friend, it's too much effort to call my mom or to call my sister, really take that time and say, even though I think I can't do this, do a little experiment where you say, I'm gonna just try. Even if I can only talk to that person for one or two minutes, I'm gonna make that effort to reach out. And what we often find when people do this is they actually find that once they're in the moment, they really are enjoying um, the engagement, that they find it does boost their spirits to be in contact with others. And it does help them again um, to get back to a place where of self-care and caring for themselves. And that really is important in this continuum. When you're yellow, you really want to be able to find yourself back into that green zone as much as you can by caring for yourself. Now, what about when we move into that orange zone? So the orange zone is when the traffic of light is about to turn red for many of us. We're really starting to have difficulties with us, our mental health that are actually, you know, impairing our, I guess interfering is a better word, interfering with our activities at work, interfering with our ability to engage with our families and friends, interfering with um, our ability to perform tasks. And here we're on the brink. This is where we really do need to reach out and ask for help. So here we may be finding, you know, interfering levels of anger, anxiety, having a pervasive sense of sadness or hopelessness, having a very negative attitude. Um, you know, and some of us will turn away from work and some of us will just dive into our work. We become workaholics during this period because it's a way of avoiding or escaping the stress of the pandemic. And that's not necessarily a healthy um, approach either, right? We could, we could turn away from this, but we can also dive in so much that we can think about nothing else and that all we do is work. Um, we may begin to have restless, disturbed sleep, and recurrent images of the past are nightmares. Our body is also keeping the score, where we may feel increased aches and pains, um, increased fatigue, and here's where we truly begin to avoid or withdraw social activities and to withdraw from activities that previously have given us pleasure. People may also begin to notice that they're relying a bit more on alcohol or gambling and those activities become hard to control. At this point along the mental health continuum, not only do we want to use the strategies that have worked in the past, but at this point, I think you really do want to work out, reach out to either peer support, maybe to your family physician, um, for help and assistance. So for example, sleep is one of the first defenses against the development of further mental health difficulties. If you're really not able to sleep at this time, it would be a great time to check in with your family physician to see if he or she can help you with some strategies or techniques or potentially even medications to help you get it back on track with your sleep. Because again, if we see that tipping point from orange into red, that's when we're in deep trouble and we really do need a higher level of assistance. So right now, if you feel that, you, that this really resonates with you, this sense of injury, I would really suggest reaching out to peers for support, um, getting a hold of your family physician. There are also five hospitals within the province who are providing free care now to healthcare workers um, so that they can receive mental health supports through the hospitals and you're fast tracked quickly in for assistance. One of those hospitals is St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. 
with another senator at the Royal, um, and these are all available to help you. And I'll send a list of those hospitals to Fatima and Kelly, as well as contact information for those hospitals where you can reach out for immediate support as a healthcare worker and get professional assistance. There's also a Wellness Together portal that's available through the government, which is an online form of receiving assistance as well. And I'll send that information out as well. What about, however, when we get into this red zone? When do we need immediate, in the moment, right now assistance? So here we're talking about when we begin to have angry outbursts, aggression, where panic attacks are subsuming or overcoming our ability to cope, um, where someone may become very insubordinate because they are being driven by those mental health difficulties. And this is not the time for punishment or remediation. This is the time for recognizing that often when people appear to be, you know, walking away from their duties are saying, I just can't do that. This is a time where we need to recognize in each other and in ourselves that this is often a feature of, a, of mental health difficulties and it's really time for help and immediate help. Um, you know, when someone is just simply unable to do perform their duties, they can't, they feel they are not in control of their behavior and they simply can't concentrate. Um, they may really not be able to fall asleep or stay asleep, and they've reached the point where they're in a state of constant fatigue and physical illness. You, people may find that they're not going out or answering their phone, and they can even begin to have suicidal thoughts. Again, this is the time for right now assistance. Reaching out to someone, reaching out for support at the hospital, your general, you know, your family physician, going through these hospitals for support turning to you know your leader your manager whoever you need to to get that assistance right now and when people are in the red zone in general it's helpful for them to get out of the situation in the moment at work and take the time to get the help and support that they need so i would say again in this situation we've got to make it safe for people to do that so we know for example with police officers when they come forward with mental health difficulties, there's often a fear of drastic consequences within their organization. So a police officer, for example, who discloses mental health difficulties, you know, ranging from orange into red, they could have their gun taken away from them, which means they can't go on to patrol. That's absolutely obviously reasonable to do, but it's also a grave consequence for the police officer in coming forward with their mental health concerns. We need to make sure within our own communities and our own practice that when people come forward, there's a safety net and a blanket for them. We need to be sure that people know where to go and they need to know that when they do go there, that they will be supported. And that's the important message that we can give one another, that we will provide one-on-one -on -one support, but also for the leaders and the administrators in the crowd today, making sure it's a safe place for people to land. It's a place not of judgment, but rather a place of where, where can, how can we help you? Where can we get you to where you need to be? We recognize you're not a superhero and we recognize between each other too. None of us are superheroes. We all have those vulnerabilities um, physical or mental that make us who we are, who make us the, the wonderful people that we are, but also that can be triggered in these situations. And when someone does come to you or when you go to someone else with these concerns, there needs to be a process of knowing where you go. So for example, if you're a team lead or a supervisor and someone comes to you, you need to know where to refer that person immediately and how to get the help that they need. And I think that's something that teams can do together to ahead of time plan together. You know, where if, if you're having difficulty, who would be the peer who really would be the person who's positioned to support you? Who is a peer that wants to be identified as someone that others can come to? In the management or leadership structure, you know, who as a manager or leader, knowing where people can go, being able to take them there or refer them to them, making sure that they get that immediate care and support. And I would say within a team-based community setting or hospital-based setting, it's really important to have a plan around that so that when someone comes and you know they're at their breaking point, knowing what that what you're going to do as a team to support that person. And equally as an individual, being prepared for going to get the help that you need and not holding back, not judging yourself, 
not having that fear of stigma, which is inevitable, but saying that I need this care and this support right now, not only do I need it, but I deserve it. Because oftentimes from past history, people feel that they don't deserve the care, that they want to give everything in themselves to others, but they're not deserving themselves of the care that they need. And again, we want to be able to turn that back and say, you know, if that was someone else, they would deserve the care. I also deserve that care for myself. Oops. As I talked about earlier, we really do often have that benefit of hindsight and thinking, you know, from what I know now, I probably wouldn't have done things that way. I wouldn't have reacted that way. And we may also have a tendency to want to blame others. Again, I want to really advocate, I can say this over and over again today, but self-compassion and other compassion during this time is what's going to help us get through this together. We really do need to be compassionate, not only towards ourselves, but also towards others during this difficult time. I think it's also important to remember that when we experience distress um, and when we experience concern about what's happening, um, we really do need to think that we're human and think of this as a sign of our humanity. Again, the underlying assumption is that we'll put health, our, other people first and not ourselves. And this is a situation where we really haven't been trained to give others the care that they need because there is no training available for this. Um, I'm gonna, I, I really wanna leave time for questions. I apologize, I always talk way too much, but let me just, I do have more slides, but let me just end by saying this before the questions. Um, we really do need to acknowledge those feelings of guilt, shame, demoralization that we're experiencing. And often we direct these feelings outward through anger, um, through st stigmatizing behavior, but we need to unpack these behaviors. Think about what past, what in the past is driving this, and again, have a sense of self-compassion. It's really important as well to be mindful of self-destructive behavior this time. So while it may feel better in the moment to have a drink, you know, to binge eat, to gamble, it's important to remember what those long-term consequences are as well of that and to be mindful and just if you've had difficulties with this in the past to really reach out now is the time to reach out to the support systems again to avoid becoming socially withdrawn and and to reach out to others to talk about and discuss current events and I think we also need to recognize that this current situation does increase risk for depression, for PTSD, for anxiety, and even for suicidality. That as teens, we need to have plans, but also as individuals. So I will leave it at that. I would love to come back again and talk because I always talk too much. But again, think about what our personal warning signs are. And again, think about what's worked in the past. So I'll turn it over for questions. I apologize if I've talked too long, um, but I really think it's important to get this knowledge out too. So I'm sorry about that. That, that's wonderful, Margaret. And you know what? Be careful what you offer because we will bring you back. <laughs> I'll come back. I'm happy to come back. I think there's so much to talk about here, right? There's there so is. much, so one much the, to talk about. One of the things that um, if anyone with questions, go ahead and put them into the chat room and I'm just going to go ahead and start. One of the things definitely is increasing awareness so people know what to look for in themselves and accept that that's perfectly normal and expected and there is help there. Um, you mentioned about how right now it's like we're in a war. So right now yeah. we're in the midst of the threat, we're focused on protecting ourselves. Yes. So some may be, um, coping in the now because yes. it's survival in yes. this marathon but uh, would you agree it's important that it's possible you may not see signs creep up until things start settling down and you have that breathing room to actually reflect yeah Fatima, i absolutely i'm not sure if it's Adam or Kelly, but i absolutely agree i think there's going to be two types of reaction here i think there's going to be the reaction in the moment when we you know some of us will um, be experiencing it and mindful of it. Others, it's going to just be happening in the background to our bodies or ourselves. And when things do slow down, there's going to be a, a much higher elevated risk for mental health difficulties. So I would say that there's two sides here. For some people, it's going to be happening in the moment. And for some people, it's going to come more towards the end. And I'm, you know, as we work to get resources together to support people, what we're our thinking is that you know we need to intervene now 
so and intervene as early as possible so that things don't get worse and recognize those individuals for whom it's happening right now. But we're also going to need to be incredibly mindful towards the end of this and as things slow down. And in fact, we may see an avalanche again of mental health difficulties as things slow down and people actually have time to reflect upon what's happened. Mm -hmm. Again, I think there's... Um... Many of us work in a group environment in teams and hospitals. Many of us are in smaller companies, which makes it even more difficult for you to really speak about how you're feeling. Yeah. Um, oftentimes you're a lone wolf and, and so yeah. forth. So I'm hoping that we're, if we start getting the message across for people to reach out to um, our peers. Yes. Um, I started a Facebook private support group called Ontario RRT Support, and I want to encourage people to continue logging in as I'm learning about the subject matter, I'm sharing information. I ask people if you're wanting to share and if you have questions that you can message me anonymously and I'll post it as an anonymous post. And um, do you have any suggestions how we can get the conversation going? There's a lot of conversation that's going out to the community and a lot of likes and hearts and things like that, but trying to get the community to talk, yeah. whether it's this larger community for social support, whether it's within your own work environment, any suggestions on how we can get people to open up and talk. Yeah, I have a couple of suggestions. I think the first is that the modeling often comes from the organization. So when people um, who are in have decision making ability are comfortable revealing their own vulnerabilities, um, are comfortable talking about the experience that they're having themselves, that modeling of opening up can be very powerful. And I think the society is doing that by being so open around the mental health difficulties that many people are facing and being open and talking about that. I think the more modeling there is of being honest and open around how difficult this is, the impact that it's having, um, and sharing as much as individuals are comfortable doing and not going past that obvious line of what's comfortable and what's not, but modeling sharing, I think is very important and often it, people take the lead from that sharing. Um, the other thing I would say is that one-on-one -on -one peer support can also be very helpful. So providing someone with a buddy or someone to talk to, particularly for people who are on their own, I think it's really helpful to talk to someone who's been through those struggles in the past or who has you know, worked for a long time as a, as a respiratory therapist, has experience, or even someone who you know is just starting out but has similar struggles. I think being able to share in a group setting is important, but also the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one support is also important. Um, and there are a lot of good manualized um, approaches to peer support. There are some documents around that, and I could help dig those up too. That might be helpful as well. One of the things you also mentioned was um, how we're reacting to the now. So our uh, experience is 10% in what's happening right now, yeah. 90% happened in the past. Yeah. Um, how can we come home, decompress, do what we need to do and support our children? Because there's many people in our group that have very children at home and how in the, this whole contest can we support our children so that this event in itself and how we're reacting and how we're coping does then not turn into a negative experience for our children that they're trying to cope with in the future. Yeah, so I would say a couple of things. I'm, I'm not a child psychologist or psychiatrist, so I'm gonna be very careful not to comment on children, um, just because it's outside of my scope of practice. But what I would say is that, you know, it's not the case that we need to hide everything we feel, right? I think we want to avoid extreme reactions around our children, but it doesn't mean that we can't be open and honest about what we're experiencing. The other thing I always say to parents who come for help as well is that you really are being a hero to your children by demonstrating that when you're having difficulties that you reach out for help. Um, I've had parents, I've seen many parents who have come and said, you know, 
I just, it's really hard for me to come and admit that I'm having a problem. Um, I feel weak, I feel vulnerable. I feel I've failed my children by doing this. And what I've often said to them, and I really honestly believe this, is that by showing that vulnerability and then modeling reaching out for help, you are being a hero to your children because you're showing them that it's okay to experience emotions, um, it's okay to recognize your vulnerabilities, and it's okay to reach out for help. And I think seeing, being able to reframe what we could see as a vulnerability or a failure is actually a true act of parenting by, um, by showing vulnerability, acknowledging emotions, and then telling your children that you're getting help. I think that's really a service that you can do your, your child, not just in the moment, but in their lifetime to model that for them. Excellent. Yes, I've always been honest with my children that, yeah. you know, moms and dads will make mistakes. We're, we're learning. Absolutely. To I'm cognizant of the time. I've got one last question sure, here. Sure. In the um, ER and ICU, dealing with someone who has attempted suicide is heartbreaking. In Ontario, you are aware of the increase in admissions to ICUs due to our suicide attempts from social distancing during COVID. Um, is there anything in the literature at this time citing numbers of suicide attempts or deaths due to uh, suicide due to suicide. Due to suicide, due to moral distress in healthcare workers during COVID. Is there any data anywhere in the world uh, regarding that? Yeah, it's a really important question. You know, we know that there have been there's been cases that have come to media attention, and people are aware of those. There has not been a systematic attempt yet to collect that information, but. I agree it is tremendously important and I'm sure that effort will, that will happen. If not right in this moment, I am certain that will happen. And I really I thank the person who asked that question for raising it because again, there's so much stigma around suicidality. Um, one of the things we, you know, we would say is that if you're worried about someone in suicidality, ask. The most important thing we can say to you is don't worry about, you know, making a mistake by asking. The first and most important thing that you can do if you're worried about harm, someone is going to harm themselves, is ask them. And uh, would you then, so you ask them, and they say that they are thinking of harming themselves, who can we call yep. to get help for that person? For instance, is Coast a national phone number? Is, uh, or is it all regional places that you call? How does that work? Yeah, there are, two, there are two ways really, well actually three. So when someone, you're with someone and they disclose that they um, are at imminent risk of suicidality, in most communities there's something, what we call it Coast in Hamilton, but what it is really is a crisis outreach and support system and those, um, those providers will actually come to the home. So if someone's in acute distress, if the person gives permission, or even if they don't, you can get them to come to the home if you're with them at that time. Um, they, well, they can also, if you, have, if you have the person's address, if you're on the phone with them, you can say, would you like Coast to come out and support you or an organization like that? Do you want me to call them with you or do you want me to call them to have them come to your home? And they will come to the home of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not willing to do that, you can say, well, are you, I, I would really encourage you, and sometimes we don't have access to that or we don't know about it. The next thing would be to go immediately to the emergency room, right? And that you could bypass coast and do that as well if you felt that was, you know, you needed to get the person to the hospital right away. Having the person go to or accompanying them to emergency is important. If the person hangs up on you, um, they won't let somebody come, they won't go to ER, then what you do is you immediately call the police and they will go out and do a safety check on the person. They will respond to the person's home. Excellent. I'm afraid we're out of time. This has been a really, really, oh, you know, we will ask you again. It's I'll, come back. <laughs> I'll come back. I really, no, I'm, I really want to support this group and thank you for everything you're doing. I think, um, you know, this is an opportunity to give back to your community for everything you're doing to support everyone else. So it would be my absolute pleasure to come back. Thank you. So on behalf of the RTSO, we'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like yeah. to thank everyone who uh, joined in on their most valued uh, lunchtime. Um, 
And once again, um, our organization is stronger the more membership we have, so go online and join there. We'll do our best to put resources up on the website. Um, right now, probably regarding to uh, mental wellness, I would direct you to Ontario RRT Support on Facebook. It's a closed group. That's where I'm putting all my attention right now for this subject matter. Um, and uh, yes, look for future um, webinars coming your way. I think we have another one tomorrow, I believe. It is on the website and on the RTSO Facebook group and on the RTSO, I mean the RRT support group. It's everywhere. You go to one of those three platforms, you will find the webinars. <laughs> Okay, and I'll send out. I'll send. Um, Fatima, I'll send you the list of the five hospitals that will offer support okay. to. Um, yep, to healthcare workers. I'll send you a link to a website that our group helped to create for public safety personnel for um, coping tips around COVID that could go into the group, and then I'll also send the Wellness Together portal link as well. Perfect. And okay. this webinar was recorded, and it will be available in a few days on the website. Okay, goodbye everybody. Thank goodbye, you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye.